Hello and welcome to episode number 88 of the 40 Athletes Podcast. Oh, actually, check that, 89. Sorry, last week was 88, 89 this week. Uh, before we get started, though, make sure you go to our YouTube channel, click subscribe, and follow us on social media so you get more of these great interviews that we have from top leaders across the world to help make you, your teams, your families, you name it, just better in general. So, Jimmy, uh, we're going to get started here today, and it's uh, we're counting down to the World Cup. You know, baseball is kind of now, still in football season, but, you know, the so- with the with, uh, World Cup being in Qatar this year, the World Cup is pushed back like four months of what it normally would be. So, um, we're going to talk a little World Cup soccer today with uh, a guy that knows a little bit about leadership. Yeah, but you're now just getting into the World Cup soccer. You're getting into how to develop and maybe a great team that can have success in the World Cup, you know, success on, and we always talk about off the field or off, the, on, you know, on, off the court. So I'm looking forward to speaking to someone that can help develop those teams to be able to have success in those in those places as well. Yeah, because, you know, typically the teams that make it all the way, they have great leadership, they have great chemistry and tangibles and all these kind of things. And Travis Thomas has worked with IMG. He's worked with uh, professional baseball teams, Georgia football, which is number one right now, by the way, and just developing Go leaders. Go, Go dogs. dogs. Sick them dogs. <laughs> so, you know, and um, he's also written a book called Three words to get unstuck. Live, yes, and. So it'd be interesting to dive into like what does that mean? What's his, you know, uh, what's his book about? And and talking about getting unstuck. I don't know about you, but I've I've gotten stuck a few times in my own. So so any way I can help get unstuck, it'd be great. So Travis, uh, we're gonna jump on today. And uh, good morning, Travis, and thanks for joining us today. Before hey guys, we head across the pond. Yeah, no, I, I'm excited. I'm you know I'm I'm getting the last bit of Midwest. Um, autumn weather uh, and a little bit this early stages of winter weather before being over in the uh, Middle East desert for the next uh, hopefully month, right? Anywhere from from three weeks to, to, to five weeks or so. Um, but really happy to be here, guys. Good morning. Uh, Jim, if you are not uh, if uh, a DJ for an evening um, radio, romantic, put you in the mood kind of show, you have missed your calling, sir. Oh, you're but, um, guy. but I hate, by the way, I, I got family <laughs> in Georgia, so that Georgia Bulldogs are like sick of dogs, right? I tell you, I tell you what, I, I got the chance to go in and, and, and speak to the team for five years in a row. Um, uh, sadly, I didn't go in last year during the national championship year, so that's probably the reason why they won it. <laughs> uh, but uh, but I'm still a big dogs fan, so go dogs. Kirby, uh, speaking of leadership, uh, I think Kirby's done an amazing job down there, um, and a big fan of Kirby and 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 the program that they're building down there. So, uh, but but excited guys, thank you. Let's let's uh, happy to jump in. <clears throat> yeah, you know we uh, again talk about leaders that uh, like want to follow leader and, and how we develop that is. You know, talking about what what makes a great leader, like what are the like the two or three things that really make people want to follow you? You know, because there's leaders that have been influential in positive ways, but also negative ways. You know, you look at World War II, but then you also look at people like Nick Saban as well on the opposite end. So, you know, what are those intangibles that make people want to follow somebody? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's a great question. And I love how you phrase it that way, Jason, the idea of. What is it that the leaders have that, that that make you want to follow somebody? Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I do a lot of a lot of my work is, is sometimes speaking to um, you know colleges and schools and athletic departments and ads and, and coaches when it comes to you know building programs and what is it about programs and you know helping coaches recruit and uh, and, and the thing I, I I always talk to coaches about you know it's like the first question I ask a coach is like hey why do you why do you coach right you know and then usually pretty quickly you get into it's not it's really not about the winning it's not about championships it's like some internal um, uh, intrinsic connection this this passion about working with young people about transformation about you know a connection that maybe they had when they were a child that that made them fall in love with sports maybe connection to the family member and it's usually this deeply intrinsic thing <clears throat> um, it's actually a s- similar conversation I had with Kirby when I met with him for the first time. And then it's like, okay, right? How do you build a program around genuinely tapping into that authentic passion that you have and, and, and having that passion, um, uh, be something that people want to be a part of. And, you know, I think when you create, when you create a culture that a, your energy and your passion is palpable and you're creating something that people want to be a part of because they feel that there's something special going on here. 
And, you know, I think oftentimes, you know, coaches think like, oh, I've, I've got to talk about, you know, the library at the school and I've got to talk about, right, like our uniforms. And these are true examples that, were, that I, I witnessed before. And I was like, no, 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 no. Like, why? Why? And this guy goes, oh, this, this baseball coach said, we were one pitcher away from making it to nationals last year. And I was like, oh. and I'm like, so if I'm a recruit and, and you're telling me that we were one pitcher away from making it to nationals that next year, pitcher, and you for 10 minutes were telling me about the uniforms that you have. <laughs> so it's like, so that I think that passion <clears throat> to, for, for leaders to never forget that, that genuine, authentic, intrinsic passion that they have. And, you know, I think back to the teachers that I had in high school, it wasn't about the course, it was about the passion that they had. And the, the teachers that had passion, those were your favorite courses because they wanted to be there and you wanted to be there because they wanted to be there. And it just made it, it made it like an in, in, in energetic, uh, uh, fun place to be. And I think, I think coaches often can lose sight of that. So that's the first thing that comes to mind, Jason. Hey, Travis, when you talk about that, like the passion, and you mentioned like, you know, they, they're doing something because maybe uh, somebody did something for them, right? And the yeah. question I have is sometimes in sports, it can be the pressure of winning the scoreboard. If you don't win enough, you're going to get fired, right? And sometimes that pressure can cause you to focus on like, you know, now, succeeding right now. Yeah. But you talk about the culture, building culture. And, and, and building that and also getting kids to be passionate about what it is you're doing. What are ways that coaches can go, okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm building a culture, a foundation. And it's more about you hear the savings, the Kirby Smarts, about the process, about being yeah. your best each and every day. How do you get them folks on, hey, we want to go win championships, mm -hmm. but here's what we're going to do each and every day to be a champion and win the day. Yeah, absolutely, Jim. I, I love that. And, and <clears throat> you know, I think – what I love about the approach of the process and do your job and, and, and focus on the moment, moment by moment by moment by moment is, you know, as coaches, you know, you never win a game by focusing on the scoreboard. You never win a game by focusing on, you know, uh, uh, as a player, I don't score touchdowns by thinking about touchdowns, right? As a soccer player, I don't score goals by thinking about scoring goals. <clears throat> what, what does it take to score goals? <clears throat> Excuse me. It takes, well... When I when I work with players, I'm like, all right, <clears throat> tell me what kind of game you want to have today. Well, I want to do this. I want to do this. I was like, all right, what do you need to do in order to to be successful? <clears throat> well, I need to I need to be aggressive. Okay, okay, give me more specific. What do you need to do? Well, I need to win balls. I need to win tackles. All right, awesome. All right, what do you do? What do you need to do when you get the ball? When I get the ball, I need to scan the field, switch fields. All right, great. Let's focus on those two things. What are those two things? Those two things are actions. And I think what what the great coaches have figured out is that. What we're constantly wanting to do is take the complex and make it simple. Winning is the ultimate goal, but how do we deconstruct winning? Well, if you de deconstruct winning, <clears throat> the only way to win is to, is to win the next moment. Right? How do we win the next moment? By being really specific on the actions and behaviors it takes in order to be successful. And so the pressure of winning, right? the pressure of winning in any organization, whether that's professional sports, college sports, or high school sports, the temptation can be about just focusing on the results, but the more you focus on the results, the more you're focusing on the pressure, right? The way to not focus on the pressure is by focusing on what can I actually control, which is actually what I'm doing right now, which is what am I doing in this moment, right? So the whole do your job play by play is, hey, the scoreboard will take care of itself if we focus on what we can do right now, right? The power of staying in the moment, the power of now. And so as a mental skills coach who teaches mental skills to, to athletes and coaches, it always comes back to all of the pressure and all the external stuff is only a distraction that's trying to take you out of the moment. And so great cultures are built on having a clear understanding of the actions and the behaviors and the qualities that allow us to be our best moment by moment by moment. And so, you know, I'm working with St. Louis University's men's soccer team right now before I head over to the World Cup. And one of the ideas that I've been sharing with the players this year is, is all we're doing is stacking moments. We're stacking moments. The team that stacks the most moments is probably going to win the game. And if we just focus on stacking this moment on top of this moment on top of this moment and on top of this moment, the scoreboard is usually going to fall in our favor. 
but it's about focusing on the moment instead of focusing on the outcome. And um, when you talk about pressure, Jim, when an athlete is feeling pressure, pressure is a good thing, right? You know, pressure is a privilege. Pressure is a good thing because you care. I feel pressure about things that I care. When I go to the grocery store to get milk, I don't feel any pressure because if I forget to get milk, it's not a big deal. But if I'm coaching, if I'm a player, and if I don't do well, I feel that pressure. Pressure just means that you care. And so the difference between being nervous and being excited, physiologically, the same things are going on inside your body. The only difference between being confident and being nervous is when I'm nervous, I'm thinking about a negative outcome. What happens if I don't do well? Now I'm nervous. When I'm confident or excited is I'm thinking about a positive outcome. Ooh, I think I'm going to do really well because of the outcome. Really, both of those are distractions because how I feel, my emotions are not a predictor of my performance. So what is, what is the solution for helping an athlete who's nervous or helping an athlete that's confident? Or, right, the solution is always, don't tell me about how you feel. Tell me about what you're going to focus on, right? What actions and behaviors are going to allow you to be effective, which always keeps you in the present moment? Yeah, you know, which before that, you know, behaviors are defined by decisions, right? So every, every great leader yeah. has to make decisions. <laughs> Some of them are you know, more about what's best for the team as opposed to what's going to be the most popular thing. And so, and then as an individual, you got to think like, I need to do what I need to do so I get to do what I want to do. So, you know, prioritizing need, want, and then popularity versus necessity. So as a leader, what are some great decision-making skills? Is there a process that you can make, you know, if you have time or if you need to make a split decision, what are those things that you see that great leaders do to make great decisions? Yeah, well, what I think great leaders do is, is, is in a, I mean, part of my, my role with, with the national team and, and, and really a lot of the work that I do is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm helping, I'm just helping articulate and, and, um, and define culture, right? The internal culture of teams. Um, and, and as you articulate it and as you define it, then it's a matter of being consistent. And so if you, if you take the, the, the national team, for example, we have three three core values, three core anchors that, that this team has been built upon, right? And so we t- we've taken these three values and with everything that, that we have done as a team for the past four years, we're constantly connecting our actions and our behaviors, Jason, back to these three values. And so when tough decisions need to be made or we need to prepare for the next game or we need to think about how we're going to respond to the next situation, you know, Greg Berhalter, who's the head coach, has done a fantastic job of we have a very clearly defined culture that's based on values and these these values are based on actions. And so all we're ever doing is we're coming back to the culture that we have created and we're responding based on the identity of who we are. And so as a leader, right, as you create that vision, right, the vision, if you create the mission, the mission, as you create the values of, of, of how we're going to to operate and how we're going to behave and treat each other, you're not having to reinvent the wheel when you have to make tough decisions. All you're doing is falling back on the culture that you've already created. And so, you know, the reason being intentional and consistent about creating that culture is because the culture is actually going to do the hard work when things get hard because you've actually developed an infrastructure to fall back on. You've developed an infrastructure that actually tells you, the staff and the team, oh, this is how we respond in this situation. Same thing with St. Louis University. You know, it's, you know, often the pregame message from the coach, Kevin Kalish, or when we go into halftime and, or we break down the game afterwards, it's, they've got three core team values as well. It's like, boom, it's in the locker room. It's, it's on the walls. And so at the end of the game, Kevin will often say to the guys, all right, how did we live our values in this game today? Right? That's our, the answer to our success is living these core values. So when things aren't going well, it's not a mystery. We just need to go back to, are we living our core values? And usually it's, how do we need to live these core values better? But you have to have that, you have to have that clear and you have to address it and weave it into to everything that you do so that it becomes really simple and understood. 
And I, I think Travis, like you said, it's like you, you hear a lot with this culture and you can have culture at home. You can mm -hmm. have values at home. Here's our values yeah, as a family, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And here's how we love them out. So a couple of things, you, and you hear it a lot of times when people come up with this culture and they come up with like, hey, here's our values. Here's our mission. And they'll talk about <laughs> it one time. And they expect <laughs> right. kids to understand it. It's like you talk about it's on walls. It's on shirts. It's, yeah. it's simplified that they understand what the values are. They can repeat it back mm -hmm. what the mission is so they can go back to it when you're facing challenges throughout a year. Can you discuss like as a coach and a leader like the USA team, uh, St. Louis, the, the Billikens, like does the coaches have the players get involved with figuring out what those values are, what the mission is to sort of buy-in? And then also can you share like the USA, St. Louis, like what are their values? So people can understand kind of if they're trying to build a little culture that they can kind of relate to that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, and to, so answer the first part of that, Jim, the, the idea of, of having your players, having your staff, involved in the culture building is really, really important, right? The, the, the more you can have involvement, the more, the more uh, uh, empowerment there is, the more is a sense of that we created this together. But there's no, there's no set rule as far as how that has to exist. Sometimes you're working with teams where if you have a young team, the coaches are going to have to maybe do a little bit more culture hand-holding to do a little bit more on the development front. If I, if I have a team that is very sort of uh, um, senior-driven, or, or older with upperclassmen, you know, um, a, a coach might, might bring those guys into the mix earlier, kind of like, hey guys, this is your team, right? This is your team. What is the culture that you want to create this year, right? Let's create it together. Um, you know, St. Louis University, and actually with, with the national team, um, uh, uh, within the team, right, right, the teams have a captain or captains. So uh, in addition to a captain and captains, um, there are leadership teams. There's a leadership group. Right. So with the national team, there's, you know, six or seven guys every time we get together that represent a cross section of the entire team. Right. So so Greg goes to these guys as as a resource. Right. To with things on the field and off the field to kind of get their sense and get their feedback. Right. It's a it's a it's another step in the leadership process. St. Louis University is similar. Right. Uh, Kevin has a leadership group. Right. Again, that represents a cross section of the 30 to 40 players that are in the roster. So it's another level of, of getting these getting the the players to be accountable and, and to take ownership of the leadership of the team. So I think the more you can have, uh, uh, so it's not, I like to think of it, right? Don't, we often get thinking about coaches and players as us versus them, right? There's us, the coaches, and there's them, the players. And it's like, what are, what are we talking about, right? It's, it's, it's we, right? The team is we. Some of us get to play and some of us make the decisions, but the, the, the team is we. It is our culture. It's a living system. And so I think you really have to have that involvement. You know, one of the things, you know, um, you know, how do you, how do you reinforce this? But, you know, like, again, after, after how, how can coaches, you know, reinforce it? So uh, at St. Louis, you're talking about the, the, the three team values they have. It's, um, it's teamwork, character, and fighting spirit. So on the one wall, boom, teamwork. The other wall, boom, character. The third wall, fighting spirit, right? Are any of those like world changing values? No. <laughs> Right. With the, the national team, right? Our three core anchors are brave, diverse, and relentless. Brave, diverse, and relentless. Are those world changing values? No. Right. We could list probably a hundred values that you could build a team on. So it's not necessarily what what are your what are your three values? It's okay, what what three values or however many values you want to create it feel authentic to you and your program. Feel are a a, an authentic, genuine representation about you, what your program stands for, right? Once you identify those, right, they're going to be good values, <laughs> right? They're going to be good values. Now it's a matter of how do we take the value, and this is, I think, where a lot of leadership falls flat, right? Is it, okay, hey, we created a mission statement, like you said, beautiful mission statement. It's on the wall of the athletic office. Beautiful. Here's our core values. Awesome. Who can't get behind all of that? And then it's like, well, how do you turn those into behaviors and actions, right? And that's, that's where the, the gold is. That's where the rubber meets the road. So if, just to go that one step further as a leader, as a coach, to be like, okay, here's our mission. Here's our vision. Here's our values. How do we turn these into actions? Well, then it's like, how do we make sure that we are incorporating character 
into our training session. We're emphasizing teamwork in our training session. We're talking about fighting spirit in our training session. Because the more you start using the language, the more it becomes the unconscious you know, thread of, 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 of your culture. It becomes, and the more you talk about it, the more you measure your success and the more you measure you know, how you do things connected to those qualities becomes, there's a great, um, I think it was Buckminster Fuller, who's a leadership uh, uh, guy said, uh, uh, we manage what we measure. We manage what we measure. And what does that mean is that, you know, I bet you the three of us did this in school. First day you go into school and in class, right? What are, the, what, what are you trying to figure out from the teacher on day one, right? What are you trying to figure out? What's it take to get an A in this class? <laughs> not, not, what am I gonna learn? You, you, you're like, what's, oh, is this, a, is this an attendance thing? Is this a participation? Is this a, you know, like what's it take to get the A in this class? Because what you're secretly asking is, I wanna know what they measure, that's what I'm gonna manage my action around. And in leadership, it's the same way, right? You work for an organization, you know right away, oh, this is what's important here, so this is how I'm going to manage my, my, my attention and my focus. Well, well, sports teams are the same way. Your athletes know really, really quickly, oh, this coach values character, this coach values um, sportsmanship. So, you know, if I wanna be a part of this team, I need to be a good sport. But we've also been parts of teams where the, where the message is, hey, we value, we value sportsmanship and we value character, but man, that one player who's really good and he misses a lot of practices and he kind of mouths off to everyone, he's still getting a lot of playing time. And I'm like, well, I don't think this, this message, that, so, so now you have an inconsistency. And so you've got to be willing and you've got to be able to, um, to be consistent and intentional about if these are your values, right? How are you going to really do everything that you do according to those values? And so part of my job with the national team is like, okay, we've got, we've got this, this, this vision of what our culture is. So I'm kind of the one guy who's looking at everything that we do internally and with the players going like, okay, how do we keep tying this to our culture? And so, um, and so that's, that's the intentional piece and over time, consistently, then the players, then everyone just kind of, it, it just, it becomes second nature, but it still requires that constant effort. I think too, Travis, and you can probably, you know, reinforce this is I think it's important for leaders and coaches to define like what the values are. Like, for example, like teamwork, <laughs> character, yep. fighting spirit. What does it look like? What's the yeah. definition of it? What does it look like to live that out in school or in the sport or at home? Yeah. Is that something you get into and kind of like, what are the actions that this looks like and what's the definition <laughs> of these values? Absolutely. And you talked about getting the, the, the involvement from the players. One of the things that we did preseason um, at St. Louis this year was we, we took, we, we actually had a team session where we talked about character, teamwork, and fighting spirit. We split the team up into small groups and each of them took one of those, one of those values and they created like, what would those behaviors look like? Right, so we, they put them on. They put them on, you know, giant sheets, white sheets. Right, we, we we wrote them all down. We collected them, and so again, we took an entire forty-five minute session uh, with the players and said, "Yeah, okay, guys, what does this look like on the field? What does this look like off the field?" Right, and got them to to create sort of like, "Yeah, this is this is how we're going." And it and, and what it looks like this year might be different from next year's team, and so you kind of you're you're always kind of going through this process. <clears throat> but one of the things that I love, you know, love doing with teams. And we've done this a few years with the guys is, you know, because of my involvement and my travel and my work. So I'm, I'm not with like with St. Louis, I'm not with those guys every day. And so I make as many games as I can, but I will frequently throughout the season, I'll do, you know, different team sessions with them. And whenever I get, you know, FaceTime in front of them for, for a session, I'll always say, okay, all right, guys, in the last week or two, right? Who here, right, in the locker room, right? Give me an example of some guys in the locker room who have really been representing character. And all of a sudden, it's the players turning to the other players and say, I want to recognize Jason because the way that Jason has been showing up at training, um, he's just been boom, awesome. And you get a couple of those. All right, guys, the last few weeks, who here has been really exemplifying what it means teamwork here with St. Louis? And now 
you've got peers calling out peers. Well, we all know the power of peers calling out peers. And so again, what are you doing? You're reinforcing, hey, here's our, here's our, here's our values. Let's talk about it. How are we seeing it? How are you guys living it? Let's call each other out in a positive way. So you're just reinforcing it. And the more you do that, the message to the group is, oh, this is what's important here, right? Not only do we talk about it, right? We, we measure it and we manage it. And um, it becomes, and it's just been interesting with this St. Louis team. This is a team that basically turned over almost an entire roster outside of a few players that went to the final eight last year. And the season with a bunch of new players started off really kind of disjointed and rocky. And, you know, as the season went on, right, the culture, right, that, that, that strong culture just brings the group together. Why? Because there is a clear idea of what our culture is. And then over time, over time, right? So, so they, they, they won the conference, you know, regular season again for the second year. And they're, right now they're currently in the, the A-10, you know, uh, um, postseason conference tournament, but will probably be in the NCAA tournament again. And it's just a great example. And then when I talk to the players who have come from other, from other teams who have transferred in from other teams or think they're like, oh, this is, they're like, it's different here. <laughs> like it's different here. We would not have been doing this at my old school or we would not. And they're, they're saying it in a positive way, like, wow, how they do things here is different. And that's, that's from having a really intentional culture. And you know that too, it's like you succeeded with, you know, maybe veterans the year before, and now you got a whole group of new, yeah. new kids, new people, and it still works. Right. And it's, yes. it works with them as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So in your book, you talk about kind of the concept behind live. Yes. And how does that get you like unstuck when you feel like, <laughs> like you're in a rut in life? Yeah. So one important word left out there, Jim, is the and, right? So, so the, the, the live yes and, so improvisation. So I, I started, I got into improvisation, improvisational comedy about 20, 23, 24 years ago um, when I was living in Boston and went through an entire training center and started performing professionally at a theater in Boston and, and still do. I still perform as an improvisational actor and comedian with a group I started in Florida about almost 20 years ago now. Um, and so for someone who grew up playing sports, that was my passion. And now I'm in my 20s and I'm learning this entirely new world of improvisation, of, of comedy and, and, and theater. And, uh, and these light bulbs were just going off for me left and right. I was like, wow, this is, this is amazing. This is like, these are great team tools. And wow, this is a great mindset tool. And so, um, you know, I did a deep dive and as I moved into the uh, performance space and the leadership space and the consulting space and all of that, I kept bringing these improvisational principles with me. And it, then it kind of became like, well, this is my niche. My niche is kind of going into the, the leadership and the performance space using these, these principles of improvisation. And so my book, Three Words for Getting Unstuck, Live Yes And, Yes And is the, the foundation of improvisation. And so not only is it uh, a tool to help us as individuals get unstuck, it has become the tool that I've used to help create thriving and team-centered cultures because improvisation by nature is a team sport, right? It's getting up on stage, um, not by myself. I'm not a stand-up comedian getting up on stage and telling prepared jokes. I'm getting up on stage with anywhere from two to six people and taking one idea that none of us know what it's going to be. And in that moment, having to all look at one another and we have to create a story collaboratively on the spot, on the fly, have it make sense and hopefully have it be funny. Well, right. Well, how do you do that? You just, you just don't, you just don't do that. Well, you do that because you're operating under this principle of yes. And right. The, and the principle of yes. And is, Hey, what do, we, we have agreed that we're going to tell a story together and how are we going to tell the story together? No matter what Jason says to me, I'm going to say yes and to it. And no matter what Jim says, I'm going to say yes and. Whatever I say, Jim's going to say yes and. Whatever I say, Jason's going to say. And so we have this relationship where, oh, we took, this, that we took the suggestion of peanuts from the audience, right? Well, now the three of us, we have no idea what any of us are thinking. And then and Jim says to us, hey, guys, the circus is starting. I've got the tickets. And Jason says, yes and. I've got a peanut allergy, right? And I say, yes, and that's okay. Um, 
Uh, and so all of a sudden, one idea, we're just, we're just yes and in each other. Yes and. So yes is acceptance and is building off of each other's ideas. And that's it. So improv in, in, improvisers, even though you might not hear them say yes and, what they're essentially doing is they have agreed that we are going to collaborate off of each other's ideas. There is no wrong answer. So if you take that into the world of sports, uh, a mantra that we use in improvisation is every time I step on stage, my goal is to make my partners look brilliant, right? What are my partner's goal to make me look brilliant? I'm, make, I'm trying to make Jim and Jason look good. Jason and Jim are trying to make me look good. Jim's trying to make Jason and I look good. We're all trying to make each other look good. So as a result, who am I focused on? I'm focused on Jason and Jim, right? And who's thinking about me? Well, they're thinking about me. So I don't need to go out there and think about myself because they've got me taken care of and all I need to do is focus on that. So in order to be successful, I've got to be fully engaged on everything going on outside of me. And I'm trying to make them look good. So guys, I mean, we're all athletes here. What if we built sports teams where every time my athlete steps on the field or steps on the court or steps in the diamond, their goal is to try to make their teammates look good and their teammates are trying to make them look good. Well, how good is that culture going to be on that team? It's going to be a pretty, pretty darn good culture, right? So if I'm out there just thinking about my stats instead of Jason and Jim, well, we know that now it's just all about me. But if I'm thinking about, oh, I know Jim loves to get the ball on his left foot, so I'm going to try to set him up on his left foot. And I know Jason likes to make runs, so I'm going to let him make those runs and I'm going to slide over and cover his back defensively. So now what am I doing? I'm being this amazing teammate. And who doesn't want to play with me? Because whenever I'm on the field, I try to make you look good. And, and when you have this team where everyone is trying to do that, that's, that becomes a really, really good team culture, a good team mindset, and a team mantra. You know, and I, I, I always ask teams when I do, uh, I love it with high school teams. I, I've done like a bunch of these recently. I'm like, think of the, think of the best teammate you've ever played with. Now, I was talking to a high school soccer team recently. I was like, think of the best teammate you've ever played with. Now, I want you to tell me, just yell them out, what, are, what were the qualities of that teammate that made him or her so special? And they got 10 qualities down the list, and I had to cut them off. And I was like, you guys just listed 10 qualities, and not a single quality was based on talent. Right? Not a single quality was, oh, man, he could just score a bunch of goals, or he was really fast, or he was physical. 10 qualities in, they're still telling me unselfish, positive, energetic, all these qualities that that's, that's what they think about the best teammate. Well, think about that. Think about if none of those are talent-based qualities, they're just about making the decision to be that person. Well, any athlete can do that today. You can be that player that, 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 you can be that, player that players want to play with. And as we know as coaches, those are the kids that you want on your team, who are the kids who are trying to make everyone else better. So from a team dynamic, that yes and mindset, I say developing a yes and culture. Well, we're all trying to, we're all trying to make each other look good. Now on the individual front, Jim, yes and is, is this great mental performance mind, mindfulness tool and this, this adversity tool because <clears throat> yes is accepting whatever is happening, right? So in improvisation, Jim, if you say to me, hey, Travis, that bus is coming right at us. If I have to say yes to it, I'm like, yes, and you know what? Uh, there, there's a child laying on the road, right? I have to accept your idea. I don't have to like it, but I have to accept it, right? So yes is acceptance. This is what's going on. I don't have to like it, but I have to accept it. What is my and? My and is how am I going to respond to it? How am I going to respond to it in a, in a purposeful and effective way? And again, yes and, yes and, yes and, yes and. Well, what are athletes doing on the field all the time, right? Every time that ball moves, it's a new reality. Well, I wanted the ball over here, but it went over here. Guess what? It's over here. Yes and, right? I wanted, uh, I wanted to be winning the game, but the referee stinks and he made a horrible goal and we're now we're losing the game. Yeah, well, what's the reality? You're losing the game. Yes. So yes is acceptance and is how you respond to it. And so I like to say when you're living yes and, you're in radical collaboration with reality. And that goes for on the field and off the field. Right, so I'm living my life in 2019 and, and working you know, and travel and all of a sudden, boom, pandemic gets dropped in my lap. But I don't like that, that's no fun. <laughs> I don't think the world wanted a pandemic, but what do I have to do? I have to accept that this is my, my current reality and my power is how I respond to it. So I like to say, right, 
you cannot control 100% of what happens to you and you control 100% of how you respond. And again, guys, our response is not winning the game. Our response is not the outcome on the scoreboard. Our response is doing what I can in the moment to have the best possible response. And if I keep replicating that, the next moment, yes and, the next moment, yes and, the next moment, yes and, I'm always doing my best with my current reality. And, you know, I was, again, I had breakfast yesterday with a, um, a professional athlete and we're just kind of having this, you know, working through some things. And I said, hey man, you can do everything right and still not win. You could do everything right and still not achieve the success that you want, right? We can't control what's outside of our control. But when you choose to do things right consistently, things will work out. It might just not be exactly how we planned, but what you're doing is you're controlling the controllables. I'm controlling what, what I can control, which is what? How I respond to what is happening, not how I control what is happening, how I respond to what is happening. And so working with athletes, if we can get athletes to go, okay, hey, I don't have to like it, but, but the quicker you accept it with the yes, the quicker you can problem solve with your and. And the teams that do that more quickly are going to be more effective. So I can do that in my personal life as well. And, and so when I can build that individual mindset and then we can build this collective yes and team mindset, it becomes a pretty, pretty good, you know, culture to, to, to be around. See, I thought this was a sequel to Yes Man. And I thought Jim Carrey was going to be excited, but I even like this better than the Yes Man. I, I do want to say this on that is I love it because we always talk about with athletes and coaches and people in life control the controllables, right? Yeah, yeah. You can't control everything that happens to you, but how do you respond? Not react, respond. Like yeah. I stop and think, think and act. But I want to go to this on that is I love the idea of this, you know, live yes and. And you talk about like the improv part of it. Mm -hmm. Are there exercises you can tell a coach maybe that you do with like the uh, athletes and groups? And because I think that could be fun and you have them doing this. So they're supporting each other, making each other look good and they're repping this out. Oh, absolutely. And, and that's, you know, I, I you know, so, so this, you know, for me just talking for 45 minutes is, is, is not the best. <laughs> so what I get to, what I get to do when I come in and work with teams is, you know, I share these ideas, but then because it's, because it's activity based, right? We, we, we just, we do these activities again, as athletes, I want the athletes to feel, I want, I want them to feel it instead of just talk about it. And so wh whether I'm doing this at, at a, for a corporate you know, executive audience or whether I'm working with, with athletes, right? We get up and we do these activities, which, which get us having to do, to do the yes and. And so even with the national team on every game day morning, I have an optional session that players can show up to maybe 15, 20 minutes long. And the goal is we just do some of these quick thinking improv games. And it's a mindfulness tool. It's a way for them to get out of their heads which is, you know, thinking about all the pressures of, 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 of swirling around to get them out of their heads, into their bodies, and to get them connecting with their teammates, having fun, and having to respond in the moment instead of thinking about the outside distractions, right? So, so I've, I've, you know, over time, improv, I'm like, when am I, you know, I'm someone who believes in meditation, and I believe in yoga, and I believe in mindfulness, and Mindfulness is our ability to be fully engaged in what we're doing. What do high-level athletes do? They're fully engaged in the moment, focusing on the most important information, not the distractions. Well, that's really, really difficult. Meditation is a tool to develop mindfulness, but I've discovered that, oh, I'm never more mindful than when I'm improvising. Because to improvise, you have to be fully engaged in the moment. If I'm thinking about the past or if I'm thinking about the future, I'm going to miss too much and I'm going to screw up. So... I've just offered it as another tool for these guys to, to develop mindfulness by just playing these games that force them to respond really quickly in the moment. And if we're focused on the moment, we can't be focused on our distractions. And so, uh, so these, these games and these tools, so, I mean, we can do a, we can so do I was going to ask, can we do we one like do right now live? Real quick. Yeah. 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 Awesome. All right. So let's do, um, uh, all right. So here we'll, we'll pick our order. Uh, I'll say a word to Jim. Jim, whatever that word makes you think of, 
you just say that word to Jason. Jason, whatever that word makes you think of, you say the word back to me, and then I say that word to Jim. And so it's just kind of like word association. Make sense? Yeah. So the, the goal here is don't think. Just for some, first thing that pops in your head, go with it, unless it's super inappropriate. But like <laughs> go, but go with it and don't judge it. Don't judge it. You don't, you might not even know why it showed up, but don't judge it. And so as I do this in person with, with the guys, I'm like, hey guys, let's get the pace going. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Don't think, don't think, don't think. But for starters, we can go a little bit slower, but don't think, just respond. So I'll go Travis to Jim, Jim to Jason, Jason to Travis, Travis to Jim, Jim to Jim. All right, you guys ready? Yep. yep. Awesome. Here we go. First word that pops in my head, Jim. Pickle. Uh, sour. Hamburger. Ooh, bun. Oh, uh, like cheese. Burger. Uh, rare. Oh, medium rare. Steak. Texas. All oh, those cows. Cowboys. Uh, Dallas. Oh, uh, what about the Indians? Cleveland. Browns. Oh, Jim Brown. Running back. Ooh, um, uh, uh, tough. Uh, quick. Relentless. Ooh, wall. Jump, jump. Really high. Uh, Olympics. Land or mat. Shoot, uh, USA. Uh, stripes. Flag. World Cup. Trophy. Soccer. Players. Team. Coach. Ball. Grass. Field. Green. Money. Success. Team owner. Uh, rich. <laughs> Manager. Powerful. Uh, uh, billionaire. Leaders. Uh, Amazon. Uh, jungle. Uh, big snakes. <laughs> big rivers. <laughs> See, we'll end it right there. Ended up big okay. snakes and big rivers. Awesome. All right, guys. So, um, so how did how did it feel while you were doing that activity? It was fun. I mean, I was like, I got stuck like one time, but I felt like I was. But it, you know, it was interesting because you had to like just like you said re respond. I feel like that sounds like a way that you would also maybe train your intuition right on just like going with your first instinct going with your first yep. thought right exactly i yeah. think the other thing too travis is like non-judgmental like you're yep. like hey anything you come up with is fine like yep. almost in athlete you're going to make mistakes yeah you're yep. not being judged but the next play next opportunity we support you we're there for you yeah yeah and so again so in order to do this right like so we all have to we've all got to be listening to each other right mm -hmm. Um, so I've got to be focused. So were you thinking about what happened 30 seconds previous? Were you thinking about what you're going to do after the interview today? Right. It forced you to be aware, right? Fully engaged in the moment. I knew that I had to listen to Jason, whatever Jason said, I had to respond to it. And so again, we talk about what is, you know, mental skills and mental toughness. It's, it's all about turning the volume down on the distractions so that we can turn the volume up on the most important information right and so we're turning by turning the volume down but what by by just focusing on listening to jason and responding to what jason has given me i am automatically turning the volume down on all the other things that are trying to get my attention right now you guys could be thinking about well what's the sound quality how much time's left in the interview well my wife said she needs me to run to home depot after the interview right all of these distractions it's life Right. And so if I get really intentional about all I have to do right now is focus on this and that's going to allow me to be effective in this. And so we're just we're, we're simplifying our focus. Right. The misconception when it comes to mental skills is that high performers have the ability to think about a lot and juggle that and still be effective. No, they've gotten really good at to understand what's the most important information to focus on and only focus on that. So I like to think about it this way. When you bring your optimal ability, your optimal ability and combine it with your optimal attention, that's where you have your peak performance, right? I'm bringing my full ability with my full attention and where they come together. Now I might be super talented, but I'm totally distracted today. Well, my performance is going to be down here. 
right? And so we want to bring those two together. And so what are we doing? We're, we're just developing a mindset and a tools that allow us to be engaged in what we're doing, right? So when a player goes out onto the field, they can be thinking and feeling a lot of things. There can be a lot of distractions that are trying to get their attention. So I just pull them aside real quick and like, what one or two things do you need to focus on right now to have a good half? I'm going to win balls and switch fields. Awesome. Focus on winning balls and switching fields. Because if they're thinking about winning balls and switching fields, now they start focusing on where's the ball? I need to go win it. I have the ball. What do I need to do? I need to switch fields. All the other pressure and stuff is still there, but the brain can't think about more than one thing at a time. So if we just give the brain something to think about, we're, what we're doing is turning the volume down on all the other things that it might want to think about that's just a distraction. You know, uh, this, I feel like this exercise that we just did to not only work with teams, but schools, homes, you know, like, so my question is like the follow-up to that. Let's say like you're in your home and parents are like, man, you know, my kid's having a hard time focusing. Let's play this game here. Like, you know, it's kind of fun. You know, kids, eat. so after that's over, what is the dialogue after that look like? You know, let's say, you know, how do you like, kind of unpack what just happened and, and then you know, get them to yeah. carry through with that? You know? Yeah, if you're, if, if you're going to use this as a focus activity, and the thing, the thing I, I should have asked you guys right after when we were done is how do you feel right now? Right? Because if you notice the energy, <clears throat> the energy shift while you were doing that, it forced what, what, it, what it's forcing you to do is even though you're, you're, you're processing a lot, it, it, it forces everything else to slow down and to calm down, right? If you would have noticed your breathing probably became more regulated, it probably became slower and deeper. And so when you do these activities, your body is automatically shifting into more of a, more of a focused, more of a calm state. And so if, 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 if you want, if the goal is, oh, things are a little frazzly right now, uh, we, want, we want to help get them focused, right? I could just, you know, we could be on the sidelines and I could pull Jason aside and go, Jason, hey, let's do word toss real quick. Here we go. Green. Boom, 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 boom. And we're locked in. We're locked in. We're locked in. We're locked in. All I'm doing is I'm getting myself present in the moment and therefore letting all the kind of float away. Right. And now I'm present and I'm more, I'm more grounded. Right. I think grounded is a good way to think about this. We're, we're, we're grounding ourselves into the moment. And so we can do that. You could do that, you know, uh, on the way to school with your kids, you could do it before a test, you can do it, um, uh, you know, when, and, the, and, and again, there's lots of these, a uh, lots of these little games that we do. Um, and all of them kind of have the, have the same Similar. outcome, which is, mm -hmm. yeah, it's any, anyway, a lot of them are, there's competitions to it. Right. And so guys love competing. Right. So you have elimination, right. When you screw up, you know, like you're out. And so, and, and so you can, you can turn all of these into little competitions, but um, there's so many different things that are going on with these, with these, with these activities, um, but, but, but focus and connection. And again, while you're doing it, it's usually eye contact. So I'm in a circle and now I'm looking at Jason. Now I'm looking at Jim and I'm looking at boom and I'm boom and I'm boom and I'm boom. So eye contact, we're connecting. I'm connecting with you. I'm connecting with you. I'm connecting with you. Um, and so it's just, it's just a great grounding, you know, you know creates a, a sense of fun camaraderie with the team. Hey, Travis, I do have this for you. You know, as a leader, sometimes you have to make tough decisions and you got to make decisions sometimes that, you know, are best for the organization, the team. And, uh, you know, some of the players or, or people involved might not like it. Yeah. And trust is so key. Yeah. And sometimes you lose that trust. It's hard to get it back. What are some maybe key tips you can give to people of being a leader, mm -hmm. how to build trust and keep the trust as a leader? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, again, if you're in a leadership position, you're going to be making tough decisions all the time and, and tough decisions that aren't always going to be popular. And, and if you're working with players or workers, whatever, they're not always going to agree with them. <clears throat> I, think, I think, you know, maybe two of the things that are super important as a leader in order to do that is um, the first thing is, is, you know, be true to your word, right? And so if, 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 if whatever you're saying, you know, be, be, tr be true to that word. And especially when you're having to make tough decisions, you know, I would say so, so that integrity, right? How do you build trust, which is, you know, doing what you say you're going to do. And when you break trust is when it starts to in one thing, but he's doing another, right? So that integrity, the integrity of saying what, 
uh, what, what you said you're going to do and, and being able to back it up with your action is super important. And I, and I would say the second thing that really leaders um, <clears throat> can, it's super, super important, and that's the ability to communicate and, and to constantly communicate. I would much rather have a leader that says to me, hey, my staff says that I, that I communicate to them way too much than the leader who says, yeah, I probably need to communicate more with my team. Because here's the thing, uh, this, this, great, this great concept of where there is a lack of communication, there is an increase of story, right? And so we know that statistically, 80% of our thoughts are negative. <laughs> so where there is a lack of communication, there is an increase in story. Those stories are never going to be good stories. So when you think about toxic environments, toxic environments can often be the result of undercommunication because decisions are being made and they're not being communicated well. And so I, I fill in the gaps with my perceptions and my perceptions are rarely going to be good perceptions if I, if I don't feel like there's a, a good sense of leadership. Um, you know, Greg, who's, who's, who's the men's national team coach, he and I were having, he, he loves to be really, really clear about roles and expectations with the players. So he's having constant communication with the players. It's not like every day and he's not like, he's like, you know, like every day telling them, now you need to do this, now you need to do this. But as decisions are being made, right, you know, you know what, who's making the team, starting lineups, all that thing. He's constantly having communication with the players to let them know this is why I'm doing what I'm doing, right? And he used a phrase one time that I think is brilliant and, and leaders could adapt it. And he, uh, he says, I'll often tell a player, Travis, I might be making the wrong, but this is why I'm doing this, right? So think of the humility in that, in that qualifying, qualifying statement. I might be making the wrong decision here, but here's why I'm doing it. So I'm telling you, this is why I'm doing it. You don't have to agree with me, and I might be wrong, but this is why I'm doing it. And as you as the player or as you as the, the employee, you don't have to like it, but you walk away and you're like, all right, well, I don't agree with him, but this is why he's doing it. And now I'm not going to go off and create this entire story about why I think he might be doing it because he, he decided not to communicate with me. And so I really think just that combination of, of, of being true to your word which we know in itself is really hard to do. <laughs> and then B, uh, really, really being a consistent communicator to your players and to your teams about why, why the decisions that are made that are made. Right? Think about the player who has is, who is maybe started every game during the season or they've played a lot of minutes every game during the season and all of a sudden there's a game and they don't play at all. And they're sitting on the bench and they're like, why aren't I playing, right? The game ends like, why didn't I play? What story is that player creating? Right, coach, uh, coach is mad at me because this. Oh, the coach is playing so and so because that's his son, or he's his favorite, or or coach is mad, right. Who knows, right? Because all you've done is that you've left you've left your player with this huge mystery of why they aren't playing, and the and their their answer is never a good answer. How difficult is it to pull that player aside before the game and say, "Hey, man, just wanted to let you know. All right, we're going to try some different things today. I know you're probably not happy about it, right? But you know." You might not play, and if you do, it might not be much, but this is why I'm doing what I'm doing, right? That took 15 seconds. And that player can sit there and be like, ah, oh, I can't, right? But now he knows, or she knows. And if things change, hey, Travis, I need you after all. Boom, bye. all right, boom, I'm ready to go. But just think about some of the times when you've been in some environments that are toxic. What do you do with other people? And then now Jim and I are talking, like, can you believe that they're doing this? And Jim's like, yeah, hey, I heard that. That, uh, that Jason's dad called the coach, and that's right all of a sudden you've got all this, and it's just like, ah, you look at the guy, the guys, the three or four guys at the end of the bench, and they're all just down there like, ah, right? And it's just, it's contagious. It's contagious and all. And if we just did a better job, you know, communicating, and again, backing up that, what we're saying with that, with, with integrity, it's gonna help nip a lot of that toxicity in the bud. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Travis, we always finish out with the uh, four questions with 40 athletes. And, you know, again, so much great stuff here to unpack with uh, – and is, and we just wanted, like, the last little bit of insight. So this is the lightning round that we always do. So the first question is this, is, in your opinion, what does it mean to win in the game of life? Yeah. All right. Yeah, win, yeah winning in the game of life. And I, I will tell this to sessions all the time. I'll, I'll tell kids, I really don't care – 
you know, <laughs> I don't really care if you guys, how successful you guys are in soccer or, or football or X. I don't really care how successful you are. But I'm like, I do care. I want you guys to do well. But what I'm more concerned in is are you using these skills, you know, beyond, beyond the sport? And so when, when I think about winning at the game of life, it's, it's about, you know, taking the skills of sports, be it character and being it, how do we deal with adversity? You know, again, talking this this professional athlete the other morning, I was like, you realize that professional athletes have signed up for a, a crash course of, of really life to the extreme because professional athletes live in a world where moment to moment, day to day, their livelihood is so uncertain. But I'm like, but that's actually what real life is. You guys just live it in a more moment to moment way. And so I think in order to be successful, it's just this idea of um, winning at life is for me is, is, is being able to have a, a clear idea of who I am and what I'm about, right? Who am I? What am I about? Right? What's my, my purpose? So my purpose is to inspire myself and others to live their authentic brilliance. So once I know who I am and what I'm about, you can drop me in any situation. And since I know who I am and what I'm about, I'm going to be able to respond to that situation. It's not what I'm doing. It's why I'm doing it. And so I think if I love for athletes to have a clear sense of who they are and what they are about, and that will go with them the rest of their life. Yeah. I like that. Uh, just a strong sense of identity. So, yeah. 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 Um, and number two, if you could spend time with anyone you admire in sports, passed away, alive, fictional, non-fictional, you name it, who would you pick and why would you choose them? Oh, man, I should have thought about this more ahead of time. Um, ah. Ah, oh, man, I, I think the, the, I, I'll just go word association, right? The first one that popped in my head was John Wooden. Uh, just from a standpoint, I mean, I felt like John Wooden laid out the framework for, for leadership. And somehow <laughs> it's, 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 I, it's taken until I think today for it to become in vogue again, but to, to create a, bro, a program based on values and principles and that, that are about the process and not about the scoreboard. And and to to hold yourself in a way that is respectable, and um, uh, t- respectable for yourself and respectable to the people that you coach, I thought was such a model. And I'm I'm excited to see that that's coming back more into vogue. But um, yeah, I would just love to spend some time with him. Mm. Travis, question number three is: What is the best advice you received from a coach you played for, been around, worked with? Yeah, I had a really really difficult four years of college soccer. Um, I probably be, wouldn't be doing the work that I'm doing today if it wasn't for going through those difficult four years. And, and I learned a lot from, from that coach that I, that I struggled being his player. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things that he would say to us all the time, um, you know, he would say, it's your job as a player to leave no doubt in the coach's mind that you need to be on the field. Right. It's your job as a player to leave no doubt in the coach's mind that you need to be on the field. And I was not that player. I left plenty of doubt. And so what I love about that is, you know, whenever I start to hear someone complaining about nah, it, yeah, the little negative victim mindset stuff, if you're truly doing your job as a player, you're not leaving it you're not leaving it up to question about whether you should be out there or not. And so I think it forces you to take that accountability uh, to an, a, another level of like, hey, whether the coach likes me or not, or, you know, like he's not, he or she is not going to have a choice. They need to play me because I bring so much to the, I bring so much to the team. That's what Travis, like I always tell players, bring value. Do you bring value? If you bring yeah. value to, to the team and the yeah. coach, they're going to play you all the time. Absolutely. Um, last question is this. If you had like one character trait or life skill of a player you have on a team or your organization, somebody to work for you, what would it be and why? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think going back to, we, you know, we were having that conversation around, around um, uh, communication, around integrity. Um, but if you, if you look at, you know, a lot of the research that's been done from high level leaders, um, I'm going to cheat a little bit and I'm just, Jim, I'm going to call it humble confidence. Mm-hmm. You know, the quality of humble confidence, humble confidence, when someone is truly confident in who they are, um, they allow themselves to be vulnerable and humble because they're, 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 they're not self-conscious about, about their, um, about their value. 
And so when I think when you see leaders who are self-conscious because they don't have enough self-value, there's a lot of protecting your own rear end type leadership. And I think the best leaders are the ones that, that you, you believe in their vision and you believe in their mission and you, and you believe that they've got the character to get things done. And they are also the ones to stand up in front of you and say, hey, I don't have all the answers. And uh, hey, I actually, this decision that I made, I got it wrong and that's on me. And we're gonna figure this out together, right? So I think that just that, that humble confidence and that, that ability to be vulnerable as a leader, um, not vulnerable in a weak way, but vulnerable in a, in a strong way to say, yeah, I made mistakes and um, I believe in us as a group to figure this out together. Yeah. Well, Travis, uh, you know, that was uh, you know, great responses as we finished out today. And, you know, as we, as we finish up today, how can people reach out to you, learn more about uh, Live Yes And? And then, you know, is there a website you got? You know, where can we find your book? Yeah, I have a website that's brutally overdue to be refreshed, but it is liveyesand.com. Uh, my book um, that you mentioned, Three Words for Getting Unstuck, Livia Sands, on Amazon, it's still there. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm on most social media, be it LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. My son has me on TikTok now. Oh. Uh, so you can find me, uh, Livia Sand or Travis Thomas, whichever one, whichever one you find. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm out there. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Travis, for joining us today. Best of luck in the World Cup, man, and uh, safe travels to you as you, uh, you know, head out there. Thanks, guys. Jason, Jim, I really appreciate it. And hopefully we can we can do another one in the future. Absolutely. Likewise. Yeah. Thanks, Travis. God bless you. See you guys. Well, Jimmy, you know, it was a lot of great stuff on on uh, leadership, you know, being somebody you want to follow. And uh, um, the improv one was fun. That was that was something that we oh, haven't yeah. done much of, but uh, something I might use, you know, in, in with teams or even at home, too, with your kids. I just kind of like lighten the mood. So. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's key. Like I said, you create those core values. What are they? Define them, live them out. What does it look like? But as you said, I love the the leadership, the trust is like, you know, your integrity. You know, mm -hmm. do what you say you're going to do. You know, if you have these values and these core values, live by them. Don't stray from them just to win at all costs, per se. And then also, like, communicate, overly communicate. Because how many times you, myself, and athletics, when I played, I remember like kids or athletes together, we'd be like, we, we would like, like try to figure out what coach is thinking or what he's mm -hmm. doing. And we would come up with these scenarios and these stories and what they might not even be true. Yeah. Instead of asking or communicating or finding out. So I think the more you communicate, the more you nip those things to keep a team united and together. Yeah, 100%. And, uh, you know, it's always, uh, we always talk about too, like, you know, how do we develop better leaders? And I think Travis gave us a lot of great insight on how to do that today. So, well, Jimmy, uh, another great episode, and uh, have a great rest of your Wednesday as we uh, roll through the week here. Likewise. Thanks, Chase. Yeah.